Oh. It's called Capitalism, Nationalism and Development, India and the Punjab economy. That's a 40 oh year work you've been doing. And uh, it's very expensive, hardback. I won't ask you to buy it, you know, to vote against the economic Look at our libraries to buy it. But ask libraries to buy it. Of course. Mm. Okay, are there any other, um, any other announcements? Apart from the main announcement, you're the main <laughs> announcement, not the, that's the main work. Um, I've got a book coming out in December, but I don't know whether I should push it or push it now. But, uh, Why not? Pakistani Diasporas, uh, by, it's the first book that's just focused on, on um, migration from Pakistan to different parts of the world. Um, it's coming out with OUP Karachi in December. And I don't have any flyers because they're a useless punch, basically, as you know, Shinda. <laughs> And so, okay, I'll have any more announcements? No, I'll hand over to Eleanor for the main announcements. Oh. And then it's 20% discount for the conference for one month. Oh, okay. You know, whether we can save money. The two main announcements from my point of view. Um, as treasurer of the PRG, which must be the poorest research organisation in the country, <laughs> um, it has been agreed that I should ask everybody except those who've presented papers for five pounds. And what happens to the five pounds is that it means that we can pay some expenses for some speakers um, in the future. So I have a list, and if you're going to leave before tea, please let me have the money before you go. And if you're around in the tea break, let me have um, the five pounds then, if you would. And if you need a receipt, just ask me for it, I can let you have it. Okay, so that is the first thing. The second thing is that as a reviews editor for the Journal of Punjab Studies, I'm on the lookout for people who will review books, who will suggest books for review, and so on. Um, at the moment, I have various books needing reviewers. For example, there's one on the South Hall Black Sisters, there's one on Sikhs in Britain, there's one on Muslim Britain, there are two on religion and violence, um, there's Kushwant Singh's Illustrated History of the Sikhs, to name but a few. So, if you would be willing to be involved in reviewing and suggesting books for review for the Journal of Punjab Studies, please let me know. Um, I'm easy to reach. I'm just Eleanor, E-L-E-A-N-O-R dot Nesbit, N-E-S-B-I-T-T, -E at Warwick dot A-C dot U-K. Um, and I can let anybody have those details um, in printed form if you want them. If you are somebody who has already agreed to review a book and has not yet done so, please see me later. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, thanks for those notices and announcements. And see, we're not going to. Can I? Oh, there is another one. Can I add something? Yes, sure. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, just about the Journal of Punjab Studies, uh, in case some of you, I know some of you are out of touch, and my apologies for that. Uh, Blog some, actually. It's me today. I should have told the guys, they're giving me some hours in Birmingham. I should have said to them, let me have some. So the uh, IWA have been. Kind of, actually, it's, it's made the IWA a bit resurgent in Britain having the Bhagat Singh anniversary this year because they've organised a few events uh, in the Midlands and in London. Um, and we've got two papers this afternoon. Um, firstly, by Pratima Mitchell, who is going to be uh, starting us off uh, with this paper called Bhagat Singh, Memories of an Next-Door Neighbour. Yes, it's not a paper, actually. This is a chapter from a book uh, which uh, was written by my father, my late father, and what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him and his role in this period and how he was as a sort of very, um, I think, typical middle class Mujabi uh, became aware of his own um, identity as a nationalist as well as being uh, torn between a certain uh, sort of admiration for, for the British as well as his own um, uh, uh, tendencies to, to, to forge his, his own way through life. And uh, I think Pritam knew him mm -hmm. quite well. I knew him. And, I, I knew uh, a very good joke. He said, I can tell him. Afterwards. <laughs> yes. yes. So I'll, just, I'll start off with uh, just reading... Um, this is, there are two volumes of his collected works. He was a journalist. And these um, articles are taken from a long period, about 60 years, when he wrote. Um, and they are published in these two volumes, brought out by Haranan, 
and they are really worth having in every library, anybody who is interested in Punjabi history, because he was quite a unique voice. So I will start off with a book review of this particular volume, which is the first one, and that will be a little bit about him. Um, this book is called Witness to History, and it was, um, it was 795 rupees, so I don't know if it's still available at that price. Um, I'll skip some of it, but I'll just go on to, uh, to start by saying no other journalist before him or after had lived so brilliant and so varied a life or has had written with so much passion and insight on the passing scene. His life encompassed almost the entire 20th century, of which he spent almost 60 years as a journalist, starting as an apprentice sub-editor with the Civil and Military Gazette of Lahore and ending as the edit editor-in-chief of the Chandigarh-based Tribune. In between, he worked in the news department of All India Radio in Delhi as an officer. Uh, he was to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the Indian Army's Public Relations Directorate, as the Director of Public Information in the then undivided Bengal government, as Assistant Editor of the Statesman, Resident Editor <coughs> of of India, and later of the Indian Express. In the course of his work, he traveled extensively around the world, met more, more celebrities than he could keep count, and um, that is uh, in, um, in an intimate way, then, he was witness to history, and that has been chosen very aptly as the title of his book, which is a collection of many articles he wrote as a correspondent, and the many editorials that he penned, all of which show um, an understanding of the events that he covered. Um, Though he served in the Indian Army during the British days, Brimbhata was a staunch nationalist, and India always came first in all his calculations, as becomes evident in his writings. Uh, those included in this book by a discerning editor are divided into seven parts. One deals with independence, partition, and two towering leaders, along with Kashmir and Sheikh Abdullah, and of course India and Pakistan. Um, Part three de deals with India and China and Tibet, and part four with India's relations with the Soviet Union and America. Part five discusses the start of the Sikh problem, in parentheses, with uh, Amritsar's tobacco war and with the Syrian tragedy of Blue Star, and part six deals with six individuals, Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, a many splendid man, Indira Gandhi, ruined by ruthlessness, Rajiv Gandhi, asset turned into liability, Gyan Zelsing, a master tactician, and Narsimha, silent and inadequate. <laughs> Part 7 is composed of miscellaneous articles on a variety of subjects which appeared in many papers. Uh, the first thing that one must remember, and this is relevant to the, the chapter that I'm going to read, is that the author writes from first hand experience. Bahatia was there, he has seen things with his own eyes and talk to people literally across the table. Um, of his experience, he, um, of his experience, um, at one point in time, sorry, Bhatia worked out from Lucknow as the uh, statesman special representative. Of his experience there, he writes with great understanding and shattered truth that partition's effect on Indian cultural life has been fel felt most not in the bifurcated West Bengal and East Punjab, but in remote Uttar Pradesh. And he adds, it has been particularly striking because, unlike the divided provinces, UP suffered no geographical change, and its Muslim population remains practically intact. If a reader, having read that first line, is then not provoked to read further, he must be a very deluded man indeed. What that shows is bringing out his special talent he had a way of holding the reader's attention. <coughs> um, then I will just skip a whole lot and um, go on to um, yes, I think that probably says enough about my talk. And I'm going to start by uh, reading from um, I think this is his second book. It's called Of Many Pastures. It's a collection of 
uh, essays. And I'm going to start with <coughs> placing the village in which um, he was brought up, in uh, we, where he and Bhagat Singh's family were, his family and Bhagat Singh's family were um, next door neighbors. Uh, it, it, it's very interesting to have a context in which to see Bhagat Singh, the subject of this afternoon. So this starts off, it's called A Village Named Navankot. Life began in a village called Navankot, some 10 miles from Lahore, a little over three quarters of a century ago. The village was on the left side of Multan Road as you moved away from the main city <coughs> and still carries the same name in Pakistan. The road lay past the extensive Punjab University grounds, on either side of which were large bungalows owned by some of the more affluent gentry. Between the bungalows on the right side of the university grounds was a residential complex called Rivaz Gardens, inhabited by the Anglo-Indian and Eurasian communities, who lived mostly by themselves in the grey racial area between the Indians and the British. They even had an exclusive social club of their own, named Robert Institute, a sister club of which was situated to the east of the city near Mughla, Mughalpura. Beyond the university grounds lay an ancient monument called Chorburji. Further on the left side, before one reached the wide fields of wheat and cattle fodder, was the palace of the Raja of Punch, a small principality under the then Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir. Beyond the palace, as far as the eye could reach, were more green fields until one arrived at the exclusive sweeper's colony of Chuyandi Hatti. Uh, the Tonga stand on the left of the road and the mobile food stalls. Entry into the village of Noankot itself lay ahead of Tonga stand. A well known landmark, I'm going to skip chunks, just, just keep into the. <coughs> A well-known landmark of the village was the Hindu milk seller and elementary confectioner named Palesha. He had bleary eyes which secreted blobs of white liquid and always gave the impression of not having had enough sleep. Opposite Palesha's shop was a tumble-down open-air establishment where the huge steel pan was always in use by the principal roaster of gram and corn in the village. She was known by her profession as the local marchant who, besides doing the roasting job in the pan of heated sand, also acted as a midwife. It was Marchen who brought me into this world in my mother's bedroom, out in the suburban villa of my father. There was not a single doctor or hospital for the ten miles between Navancourt and the city of Lahore, nor a post office. We had a small horse carriage, although my father invariably travelled to his office in the old Northwestern Railway establishment, on a bicycle, the seat of which was covered with a stuffed khaki cushion. Beside the horse carriage, called Tam Tam, there was a tonga, which did not belong to us, but to a Muslim friend of my father, who lived in the neighborhood village called Itcha. Since the road between Navankot and the village of Itcha was unpaved, potholed, and dusty, the tonga, after finishing the day's business in the city, which meant Lahore, Sheher, was left at our bungalow while the pony was led away to Itra by the coachman, whose name was Karandin. Um, on the other dozen, off the other dozen or so large bungalows in the Navancourt complex, the two most imposing buildings belong to the family of Sir Gangaram, the famous irrigation engineer and philanthropist, whose name still adores a famous hospital in Delhi, which migrated from Lahore. Sir Gangaram, did not himself live in either of the two palatial houses. These were occupied by his younger brother, Lala Bhagatram, and the latter's sizable family. Bhagatram was an eccentric person, but totally devoted to Ayurvedic medicine. One of the two houses was used as a small medicine factory, where he lived himself. The other house contained his family of three sons, um, and um, one of them, Das Ram, a trained tailor master, started his own business in New Delhi's Canal Circus under the name of Goyal Brothers. I don't know if any of you remember Goyal Brothers, but I do. What happened to the two older brothers was not known to me at the time, but the senior of the two, Sarani Ram, had a fairly large family, and the second, Shadi Ram, was known in our village for his love affair with and marriage 
Look in trouble, you mean. Dioki. It was quite a scandal those days to be involved in a love marriage. And my mother and other women in the neighborhood spoke in hushed tones about Shadi Ram's affair with the enchanting Dioki. Um, other close neighbors included Lala Mulkraj Bhalla, brother of the great Arya Samajalida Mahatma Hansraj, and the author Mahasha Sudarshan, which is not his real name. Lala Mukraj was one of the founders of the Punjab National Bank and walked every day to work at his bank office in Amar Kali Bazaar, which was our local version of New York's Fifth Avenue and back. He was a vegetarian and Spartan in his lifestyle, wore a close-knit long coat, pajama, and tussled turban. So Darshan was, for my age group, a miracle of creativeness, whose wife, Leela Bhatti, used to tell my mother how her famous husband, then rated in short story writing, close to the great Munshi Premchan, concentrated in the process of creation by standing in a dark room, holding on to a straight-backed chair. She fed him special pure ki ladus, for the rabbit, nourishment <coughs> for his overworked brain. <laughs> Both <laughs> like... That's what academic <laughs> Both Lala Mukraj and Mahatma Sudarshan left Navankot before we did to get within better reach of the uh, within reach of the better living facilities of the city, which we call Shah. I did not again see much of Lala Mukraj, but kept running into Mahatma Hansraj and Sudarshan, who, having fallen into rather unhappy days, wrote publicity songs for a shoe company of great eminence that had started by Lala Dhani Ram Bhalla. No close kinsman of the other two Bhallas. I still remember one of Sudarshan's verses recited by a woman in praise of the Bhalla shoes, which ran Boot Pale de Ble de O Sanu, Rose de Ali Kahar Tuanu, which means Buy me Bhalla shoes, I beg you every day. There was another famous verse written by Sudarshan about a modernized Punjabi girl who nangre chipar ganya, and our Kalivich ganya. Uh, which means <laughs> English and have uh, become familiar with Anarkali Bazaar. Lala Dhani Rambhala and his family later shifted to the city and thereafter, as the sons grew up, to the more modern and sophisticated shopping center of the mall, where they set up a much bigger shop in Shadun building, which is still very much a landmark in the hall. The Bhalla shoe magnates showed great in enterprise in their business and got into the manufacturing of flex footwear. While Lala Dhani Ram was a distinguished Arya Samaj leader of his time, quite a social reformer in his own right, and blazed the trail by selling shoes. Many in the Hindu community thought he had demeaned himself by engaging in the lowly profession of mochi. That kind of derogatory remark never bothered the family for all the boys worked either at the retail shop or at the flex establishment in Kampu. I, I wonder if this is the same family that um, Bikram Seth's father writes about very movingly. So it could be, because he was a shoe make, uh, came from a shoe making family in Kampu. Away from our village home in Narnko, the city of Lahore was a different world of an affluent middle class engaged in trade and commerce civil servants of various levels of importance and incomes, professionals like doctors, and some of the rich landed gentry of Punjab, who chose to spend a good bit of that time away from their huge country estates, which you were referring to. We, we refer to the same time. Um, the principal social life pattern was set by the middle class. Club life was a relatively unknown experience to all except a very few Indians, even in Punjab's main city. The British ran and owned the exclusively white Punjab club and the Lahore Jamkana, where cricket and tennis were played, and which had only half a dozen Indian members in the 30s, and only because they played cricket or tennis and were well placed in life. They included Dr. Vishwanath, who taught zoology at the government college and was our cricket coach, Dr. A.R. Mehta, director of health services, and father of the still school going Dave Mehta, the distinguished sightless author. Yu Kramit, a Cambridge-educated professor at the Islamia College, and Muhammad Sleem, a barrister and an international tennis player who is also a Cambridge Blue. Sleem was the maternal uncle of Manzur Kadir, 
who was at college with me and became foreign minister of Pakistan under Ali Khan. Um, socialist extravagance of the kind we now see in our country, especially in the metropolitan cities, is practically unknown. All the weddings and the very rich families were not, the in, were not inexpensive at best. No drinking was done at Indian social gatherings, and when I first saw you, Kramit, and one of our government college teachers, Amul Kram Khanna, with glasses of scotch in their hands at a private dinner in Jalanda, I thought they would soon get drunk and roll around on the floor. They, that they did not surprised me, and the fact that they still talked and behaved normally was a slight shock because of the horrifying stories of drunkenness narrated to me in my childhood by my mother. Middle and upper class Indians in Punjab had two principal ambitions in life. To get for themselves or their sons jobs out of the government and to acquire British titles for themselves. Our then rulers were only too familiar with this hunger for status and distributed such favors with care and an eye on expectations of loyalty from the recipient. I think Lahore had more knighthood decorated Indians per square kilometer than any other city in the country, and the Rai Bahadur, Sadar Bahadur, Khan Bahadur, Jang Bahadur, Dwan Bahadur, Resad, Sadar Sad, and Khan Sad were a dime a dozen. Now, after a time gap of 60 years, I'm able to recall the names of several of the Sarsats, as they some call these pillars of the empire. Among the Hindus so titled were Sir Shadi Lal, Kamar Sir Dalip Singh, Bakshi Sir Tek Chand, all high court judges, Chaudhary Sir Chotu Ram, Sir Manohar Lal, and Sir Goku Chand For the similarly privileged Muslims included Sir Sikandar in Ahad Khan, Sir Fazl Ali Sain, Malik Sir Khizra Hayat Khan Tiwana, Malik Sir Umar Hayat Khan, Chaudhary Sir Shahabuddin, who became Speaker of the Provincial Legislative Assembly, Sir Zafrullah Khan, and Sir Abdul Qadir a high court judge and the father of Mansur Qadir. The more notable Sikh knights were Sir Jupinder Singh, Sir Sundar Singh Majithya, Sir Bhuta Singh, and Sir Soba Singh, a Punjabi who lived in Delhi and had a big hand in the construction of the capital when it was shifted from Calcutta. His son is, as you probably know, Sir so uh, Kachwan Singh. Oh, here that he received the pardon of Bhushan of the independence, but many years later returned the honor in protest against Bhushan. Knighthood awards occasionally produce amusing results. In UP, for instance, a very eminent citizen and at one time chairman of the Provincial Legislative Council found to his embarrassment that as Sir Sita Ram, he was at times addressed as Sir Sita and his wife is Lady Brown. In <laughs> the first Secretary General of the Ministry of External Affairs and later Governor of Bombay was named Sir Girja Shankar Bajpai. Girja was another name for Lord Shiva's consort, Parvati, and Sir Girja did not sound too good when the first name was separated from the second and the cast. Now we get to Bhagat Singh's neighborhood. In addition to us, this gives, it, I just wanted you to have a, a flavor of, of the way uh, <coughs> that my father perceived the, uh, the, his, his own circumstances uh, 60 years later. In addition to us permanent residents, some transients came to live at the residential complex in Nawankot, stayed for a year or two and went away. Some came for a change of air. Others who wished to give country life a start, I tried. Among the families who, which marked time until their next move was Sadar Kishan Singh and his wife, children, and cattle. A couple of buffaloes and two white cows, which were loved and cared for, next only to the children. One of the younger calves even spent the winter nights in Sadar Kishan Singh's room, tied to one of the legs of the bed. The children included Shahid Bhagat Singh, the eldest of three brothers, then barely 15 and 16, Kultar and Kulbir were the other two sons, and Amarji Kaur, then around 12 or 13, who called her Amro, was the number two of the group. The low wall that divided our own house from Sadar Kishan Singh's was only a symbolic frontier, but there was a lot of to and fro on either side of the wall. Aunt Vidya, the mother of Bhagat Singh, 
and my mother, Paul and Baby, had frequent gossip sessions at our house discussing children, the state of the cattle, we too had a couple of milk cows, and the other neighbours. So now Christian Singh, a judge Singh, Sikh, who was very much a master of his household, and occasionally beat up on Vidya. Vidya would later complain to my mother, uh, but he was equally fond of her, and we heard from her an occasional report of the husband's inquiries about her health. Did your bowels move today? It was one such occasion of inquiry. Very fond of us. Um, it was not until some 60 years later that I learned that Bhagat Singh, my childhood hero, was a Rampawara caste. The Jats really used their caste or village suffixes in my younger days. The information came to me when I received from one of the younger brothers an invitation card for the wedding of the latter's son, or was it daughter? By then I was living in Chandigarh and the host had his headquarters at, quarters at Faridabad in Haryana. I couldn't go to the wedding, but the fact that the family still held me in affection greatly moved me and brought back nostalgic memories of our days together in Navancourt. So that Krishna Singh, though Kesh Dari Sikh, was very close to the Arya Samaj movement. That's an interesting mm -hmm. which will sound odd and even sacrilegious to his community today. After three or four years, the family migrated from Naranko to a new village home a few miles away, and I think Rakesh, your family, then come into this. No? It, it, that, that's that's a village, it's not a few miles, it's about from Lahore to the village is about four hours, so it's about 200 kilometers. Right. So the dates would be crucial yeah. ones. Um, by then, of course, Bhagat Singh had disappeared from home and actively joined the revolutionary movement. Not very long after he was arrested for his involvement in throwing a bomb in the then Central Legislative Assembly and his share in the murder of the British Assistant Superintendent of Police, named Saunders, whom Bhagat Singh and his killer associates had mistaken for Scott, the SP who had led the Lati charge on La La Lajpat Rai, which subsequently hastened the death of this great freedom fighter of Punjab and one of the greatest orators known to me in my life. After a brief spell at Common School in Lahore, the Sacred Heart, my father sent me to the DAD primary school in the city, which was next door to the famous printing press of Rai, Rai Sahab Munshi Gulab Singh and Sons, one of whose progeny, Rai Sahab Somanlal, later shifted to Delhi and came to be known as one of the major disciples of Sai, Sai Baba. It was the former who built Gulab Bhavan in Delhi's Fleet Street, known by the name of the Harish Shah of Omar. By virtue of being my senior by three or four years, and the fact that he was a highly responsible and sober young man, my father named Bhagat Singh, who had also by then been admitted to a special class in my school meant for children with a rural background who did not understand the English language, my supervisor and the informal guardian of the school. Bhagat Singh could do good care of me, but was never intimately interested in my education or in my daily life. As I was to discover much later, he had more, a more important interest in his life than to bother about a young boy of ten. Bhagat Singh was already then on the fringe of joining the revolutionary group which was operating in Lahore. Thoughtful, rather gentle in speech and economical in words, Bhagat Singh was a handsome young man who wore a simple white turban but did not yet have signs of a beard or a moustache on his face. There was always a touch of mystery about his way of life and activities, which even the parents were probably not aware of. I still remember Bhagat Singh's white mongrel dog who followed him all over the place. The dog had pink eyes and the village in size was an uncommonly gentle member of the species. Bhagat Singh said to me and another neighbor of his age group named Shibla Chopra, but the dog must have been a sadhu in his previous incarnation. When Bhagat Singh suddenly disappeared from home one day, the parents did not appear to be inconsolably grieved. His mother came over to our house and said to my mother, Purandei, Bhagat Sino has gone the way of his uncle. The man she referred to as Sadar Ajit Singh, a well-known anti-British -British rebel at the time, who came to be known during World War II as a broadcaster on the, on the Axis radio. During the early years of World War II, I was in the news organization of All India Radio, some years before it became Akashvani, and it used to be one of my jobs to listen to the enemy propaganda. 
Sadat Ajit Singh took plenty of liberties with his war opportunities and in the course of his new news broadcast used to break into the choicest down-to-earth Punjabi expletives against the British. <laughs> from then onwards, Bhagat Singh was lost to us. One heard about him occasionally from common friends or his relatives, but he was seen only in posters stuck on walls by supporters of the freedom movement, such as this. <laughs> um, uh, he was invariably, yes, uh, is shown with a, a small moustache and a felt hat worn at a slightly rakish angle. <laughs> In later years, this seemed to offend the sentiments of a section of the Sikh community. A compilation of the biographies of the heroes of our freedom movement was one day brought to me by the author. I turned quickly to the page where Margaret Singh was mentioned and was surprised to see that his fierce they said his face had been given a beard. There was no sign of the felt hat, but he wore a turban, much too big in size compared to the headgear I'd seen him in during our days in Nalan Court and the appearance in which he was seen by many in court during his trial for sedition and murder. I asked the author of the book why he had transformed the great martyr's appearance in print. The author confessed to me that members of the Sikh community had protested against the martyr's appearance without a beard and a turban. Many years later, the trustees of the Tribune were forced to do the same thing to Sadar Dial Singh Majitya, the founder of the newspaper. The elegant painting of the Sadar that hangs at present in the foyer of the Tribune building in Chandigarh presents the father of this great institution as a turban Sikh, which he was not for years before he died. In fact, um, this brings to mind a book, which I think, Elena, you might have seen, the book I wrote about uh, um, the guru, um, it was for children, and um, I had some very angry letters because you know, there's a picture, uh, there's a, it's a story about a young boy who's growing up in this country and um, how his parents decided to cut off his hair at one point because it's just such a nuisance for him to comb it every morning. And uh, the publisher sent me an agitated email to say that they, somebody was threatening to come and blow up the office. <laughs> Or would I retract and write an apology? I said, certainly not. You can handle this yourself. It's nothing to do with me anymore. But so you haven't said I saved you. You did. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you verified the fact, didn't you? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Bhagat Singh's trial, as we all know, dragged on for a couple of years. When asked whom he wished to see for his last meeting before he was hanged, he mentioned the family of Lala Harnarayan Das, my father, and according to his mother, especially asked for me. We did not know then that he was living the last few hours of his life. The next morning, on 24th March 1931, our newspaper hawker went around screaming much louder than at his usual level of salesmanship, Bhagat Singh Rajguru Sukhde Ko Khansi Par Ladka Diya Hai. Uh, I was eating an early breakfast and prepared to go for my annual examination at Government College and the earth slipped from under my feet. I shook and wept at the same time. My younger sister, who was serving me my meal, had been equally shaken, could do nothing to console me. Weeks afterwards, Aunt Vidya came over to our house in Lodge Road in the city, to which we shifted in 1926, and sat with my mother, who had by then started crying at the sight of a mother's mother. Don't weep, Poon Bey, said Vidya. Bhagat Singh forbade me to shed tears over his death. After all, he killed an enemy of the country. Sadat Kishan Singh did not survive his de son's death for very long. The mother lived to a ripe old age and was honored by the then Congress Chief Minister of Punjab, Gyanis Dal Singh, with the title of Punjab Mata. One of the two brothers of Bhagat Singh saw him a few times at the Tribune office in Chandigarh and also brought a few sheets of typed papers carrying notes made by Bhagat Singh during his incarceration. These papers are still with me. Um, I'm very anxious to try. Mm. I have to look for them. Uh, Bhagat Singh had by then started leaning heavily on Marxism, but he was a nationalist of the purest breed. I rate him higher than many of our eminent freedom fighters. Had he lived longer, the shape of India's political future would have possibly taken a different turn, I'm sure you would. The thought of Bhagat Singh nearly 60 years after his death still brings a lot to my throat. 
Now, I'm not going to finish the rest of the chapter because it's not relevant, but um, there is something about uh, politics and that time at Dublin College, which I think is very interesting and relevant. Um, I just start with, uh, this, this is called Heady Days, this chapter. It was, uh, in that, this is talking about Government College and the people who taught my father. It was in that environment of Western academic influence and lifestyle that I came face to face with the national movement for independence from British rule. Gandhiji was at the top of his popularity and Jawaharlal Nehru was a rising star. When he came to Lahore in 1929 to attend the Congress session, he was given a white charger to ride on at the head of the procession from the railway station. The Nehru family on the whole seemed to belong to the nation, and the illness of Indira's mother became a national concern. Legends about Motilal's and Jawaharlal's lifestyle and their sacrifices in the national cause were part of common contemporary law. Um, we at Government College were strictly forbidden to take part in politics and, of course, the freedom movement. While certain other institutions occasionally came out in support of the movement and some of their students even got arrested and went to jail, we lived mostly in loyal isolation. One knew that a shady political record would, in the eyes of our then British rulers, mean denial of employment under the government. The majority of Muslim students, especially those from privileged families, seemed totally indifferent to the agitation for independence. This is an interesting point. I, I didn't, wasn't aware of this before. I was deeply hurt when a senior Muslim student told me that Motilal Nehru had kicked a bucket. It sounded irreverent to the point of blasphemy. The only student, um, no, I'll just go on right here. Looking back at those heady days of, of agitation for independence, I can recall clearly the pervasive enthusiasm of the period. For at least 50% of India's present population, 15th August 1947 remains a firm dividing line between slavery and independence. And so it should be if one's calculation of history is to be determined solely by dates on the calendar. But history does not have an abrupt beginning or a sudden end. My childhood memories of the mental and physical preparations for independence are even more vivid than those of the day when the British physically transferred power to Indian hands. Independence was in the making for over a quarter of a century prior to 47. Um, those years carry for me a nostalgic quality, both for the faith many had in their future destiny and the simple ways in which they supported the struggle for freedom. Not everyone participating in or watching the bonfires we made of British cloth viewed the act as only a token of our resistance. Some indeed thought that the fires we lit would really consume the British Empire. The mills of Lancashire were the symbolic citadels of British authority. Since we could not destroy that authority on the spot on Indian soil, we trained our guns on remote Manchester and waited for our scared rulers to run away to their homes in Britain for safety. <laughs> and there's another very touching um, couple of sentences here. When um, the England team visiting in India in um, 1932, um, and my father recollects C.K. Naidu played against all three visiting combinations. We did badly on the whole, so the English were much too good for us, which went off to prove in my eyes that now here's where this mixture of admiration and, and resistance comes in, that our rulers were a superior class and also insufferable oppressors. Nevertheless, there were moments of elation. Every sixer hit by CK against the visitor's slow bowlers was as good as a nail in the coffin of the British Empire. So um, then uh, the next little bit. Beyond these samples of vicarious heroism, however, were real life stories of simple faith and tender superstitions. Way back in the early 20s, when we lived in Northern Court, we were as watchful of the movement led by Gandhiji as those in the thick of battle in the city. During one of the neighborly visits to us, Bhagat Singh's mother, we addressed her as Deveji, sounded unusually happy and excited. What's the matter with you, Vidya Bhan? My mother asked, a bit puzzled. With hands outstretched over her shoulders, the lady who 
must be well supported at the time, said, look, Purim Bay, freedom is coming. They're cleaning the sarawar, the pool, at the bar sound. And whenever this happens, the throne topples. Takht ultao, And we should get ready for Azadi. My mother, less politically conscious than Bebeji, spoke to my father, who was no believer in superstition, but was as eager as anyone else to see the British out of India. Well, he said, compromising, without compromising his anti-superstition philosophy, the Andres will have to go whether or not the Sarawar is clean. <laughs> 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 and there's another tiny anecdote, and then I'm going to stop. In this environment of expectation and hope, stories about our coming freedom multiply. Indra, the wife of another of our close neighbors, Ram Rapan Mehta, who rose to become treasury officer to the Punjab government in the 30s, and subsequently um, a high commissioner in Pakistan, narrated the following incident to my mother a few days later. As the butcher, a white man in a hat, according to Indra, was about to slaughter a cow, the sacred animal stood up on her hind legs and with her forelegs raised heavenward said, no more, you puppy. Freedom is coming. <laughs> my mother and I, and not my father, readily believed in your story and carried it to other listeners in a manner suggesting that we had personally witnessed the cow's protest. <laughs> so this is just a little vignette of... Uh, very unacademic freedom, but um, personal. Anyway. Are there any um, comments? I suppose not questions, but yes, I could. Yeah, maybe questions, questions. comments, or evocations. Yeah, so or I think Rakesh has got lots of stories. I've just been back to the village. Yeah. The village. He was. I thought he was born in the village where I was born, called Katkatul Chandaji. Mm. In fact, it's the ancestral home of his parents. Ah, okay. So there's a museum just outside the village, and the, the home where the, the family lived has been turned into, into another kind of museum. Mm. Now, the house is only about 50, 100 yards apart. And I'm trying to figure out why Pakistan mother used to come to our house to see our grandmother, and would refer to my grandmother as Chachiji. And I've done a bit of research and figured out why she would call my grandmother Chachi. Mm. So whether you're not Punjabi Chachi, would be your father's younger brother's wife. And, and, and what I've figured out through a bit of research is my grandfather was born in 1868. Long time ago. He married my grandmother in about 19, oh, 1919. So my grandmother would have been born at the same time as Douglas because she was about 12 or 13 when this 51-year-old man married her. This is a family history, but it also gives you a picture of what was happening in those days. Mm. So this 51-year-old man married this 13-year-old uh, girl, who then produced three or four children, and, and the grandfather died. And so my grandmother was left with three children. One died, I think, in childhood, in our ancestral home, which is not next door, but a few doors away. And so I've got men vague memories of this, I assume was Bhagat Singh's mother, my, my older brothers remember her better, coming into our house, because here was this young girl, about 17, with three children, and a widow. So I assume the older women in the village, that, that would have included Bhagat Singh's mother, would have then looked after her. But because of the relationship, because of my grandfather being very old, that's, that's the only, I was trying to figure out why yeah, with the other caller, yeah. Chachiji. So, yeah. so the, the, has anybody been to the village? Have you probably I've heard, I've yeah. passed by the village. Ellen has been. I've been to the museum. Been to the museum. Been to the if you go on, if on the main road from Amritsar, Janda to Chandigarh, buses don't stop there. It's a strange thing. Bus drivers will not stop there because it's not a scheduled bus stop. So if you want to get off there, you really have to plead with the bus driver <laughs> to let you off. Uh, and I said to him, now, look, I've not been back to my village for 47 years. I've come back to my <coughs> He then agreed to let, stop and let me off just outside the museum. Uh, I was, I got a minute of mission to be there for 28th of September. But what I discovered was that the mailer had been usurped by the gov government. I, I went there thinking there would be ministers and the president. 
But they, they all got to Amritsar. So the big mill that was actually not in the village, but in Amritsar. In the village, I found not one, but two mailers. There's, there's a commercial thing where somebody said, I'll capital garments or something. They, they, they'd taken over the mailer and turned it into a money-making racket. The big mailer, which is by the museum, and the, his name is Purival. He, he's a very rich landowner in the village. He basically said, I'm running the show. I'm going to film it. Nobody else is allowed to make any, take any photos. And I'm going to sell videos and CDs of it. So there was two rival mailers going there. I'm saying all this because it, it, in anticipation of your paper, you know, who's appropriating that mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were buses there from Uttar Pradesh, from Bihar, from Gujarat. People had travelled for days by bus mm -hmm. to get there. And there wasn't just one tent, there was the government tent, there was a Khalistani tent, there was a Communist Party tent. Mm -hmm. and, so, mm -hmm. and it was, <laughs> it wasn't just the commemoration of this man who ancestors came from my village, but it had been turned into a circus. Um, the last point I want to make is, you mentioned the mills of Lancashire. Uh, we, I heard a few speeches made by local politicians, and some of them were very poignant and, and kind of quite sad. He said, look, we spent years trying to throw the British out, and yet nowadays people are selling up their land houses to go there. He said, that's bad enough. But people are spending up to 20 lakh, 20,000 quid to marry their daughters off to people who are living abroad. And there's a lot of ironies going on there. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, my father actually came and worked in a, a, in a cloth factory in Lancashire. That's where he died. But it's ironic that we burnt the flag and burnt the, the cotton mills of Lancashire. Yet many of my villages actually ended up in Manchester and Bradford working in those very cotton mills. My mother worked in a cotton mill in, in Lancashire. Uh, so it's, there's a lot of... I, I've only just started thinking about it because it, it's only come home to me. Uh, so I'm saying it with some kind of trepidation, but I was actually sitting on the lap of Bagasi's mother as a child. Mm -hmm. And it's... it's uh, having heard, read your father's story, I think I'm going to do a bit of writing. Mm, that's good. Um, um, Thanks for that. Um, that was really, I, I was um, I was quite sort of uh, interested in um, what your father was writing about Lahore, um, because I and mean, you know since we're doing vignettes and uh, I thought I could make a little contribution as well. Um, in that um, Lahore was a was a very modern city um, during during the twenties, um, during the period that Bhagat Singh was there and. Um, and one of the ways that you know you could see how modern it was, and how some historians have sort of you know assessed it, is that it was um, it had one of the fastest growing um, cinema chains. There were loads and loads of cinemas, and um, one of Bhagat Singh's friends, I think it was Raj Guru, I can't remember, um, said that if you ever want to find Bhagat Singh, like if the police ever want to find him, they will um, find him in a cinema. Um, because he was so obsessed with these new films coming in, you know, even, even not just the Indian um, films, because there were some Indian films made, but but also um, Hollywood. I mean, you know, it wasn't as it wasn't it wasn't as like superstar system, but there were films coming in. And um, in his diary, which you can see in the Murthy um, have an old copy of it, um, there's even um, a um, he'd planned out a heist, a bank raid. That he he got the idea from a film, um, and, and you know he thought that he you know they could get some money, some funds, and it never happened. But it's it's all based on a film that he saw, um, and so you know he wasn't. It's not as if uh, I think what the sort of impression that I like to have of Bogart Singh was that he wasn't just um, a single-minded um, nationalist. That there were lots of other sort of aspects to his person, for example, his sort of obsession with film, that, uh, and I think when you make somebody a martyr, mm -hmm. you forget those sorts of, um, I think, equally important sort of characteristics of yeah. the individual. That's a very good point. Yeah. And there's so many narratives in any case running through everybody's lives that the edge is always fuzzy. And as a fiction writer, I know that, and it's, it's constantly challenging to try and sort of push the limits of what you can imagine somebody's life to be like.
Was your father's family uh, involved in the Congress then? Your no, grandfather? not at all. No, he was a ra he worked for the railways. He because was a civil like, servant, because I, um, I think obviously the Pakistan's family came there uh, on the kind of run, essentially, you know, as part of their movements around Lahore, because the village Bengal sort of comes up, and there's several villages that they. So I was just interested in why they would maybe end up there mm -hmm. in that particular village, or see it as a particularly maybe a safer space for them to be in. Because the family is all the family. I mean, like the, the family is seditious. I mean, the family you is known as being yeah, yeah. Because the yeah. family is known as being troublemakers. Yeah, yeah, so obviously, yeah. the British would be yeah. have people yeah. who know. So I just it was interesting because it, even at that stage, I think Gishan Singh was moving for economic reasons. Uh, it wasn't moving because you think no, there was. No, I mean, Ajit Singh was seditious, but mm. Gishan Singh was, you know, an Arya Samaji mm. and um, n not actually having land. And I think that's in, in oh, okay. But then yes. how did he afford to send his son to DAV school and afford to send his son to these places? I don't think he was a poor man. He, I think yeah. he was poor man. Yeah, I mean, no, he, he was, was poor, poor, but he didn't live off the land. Yeah. Oh, actually, he lived off the land. What did he live off then? I don't know. But no, not he like, he didn't, it wasn't just... This is, this, there's so many yeah. parts to this puzzle yeah. <laughs> like, that I still I can't work out. I, I've written it down. down. My impression is that he was better off. Oh, and the ancestral home, which is now in ruins, yeah, preserved some of it was the biggest, tallest house in the village. Yeah. So they, they were, they, no, but they had moved, they, they were canal colonists, right? I mean, that's why it goes back to our early morning, it goes back to the morning paper, these were canal colonists, they moved from... And then saying they're in Dawa, when actually the other literature says there were some... Oh, yeah. So I this is also interesting, actually it's really interesting, this kind of stuff, that, this kind of perception yeah, yeah. Is, is, is quite, it's interesting because in some ways it's a slight skew, yeah. but it, it also is some way the view of the kind of Katri, uh, the Hindu view of the peasant, <laughs> right? You know, this, that's what came out strongly for me. Mm -hmm. Is in some ways it was almost the kind of it's that kind of view of the rural Sikh peasant who's coming in yeah. to that village. So there's a real it, it's a it, it's it, it, it's a there's a disjuncture between what these people are actually doing here mm -hmm. in this very middle class affluent Lahori, and they're all Lahori wannabes. I I think you know when we say middle class, we actually mean lower middle class. Yeah, in India. In no, India no, 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 I mean rural. So no, I mean rural. rural uh, there's a you know rural kind of affluent, right? Yes. The rural affluent, and and I think there's a real. Um, so there's a, there's a lot going on actually yeah. in the narrative, but then yeah, so that misreading of Rindavan Sandhu which is com would be completely normal because actually it's just a god, right? It's any old kind of, and they what may have said they were Rindavans just to make me the people they come to see because they don't want to be traced back to some other what, life. What so. is the difference? Can you explain to me? Oh, what's the difference between Rindavan and Sandhu? No, Sandhu or Sandhu. Because I, 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 his brother, younger brother, Kutar Singh, he contested the assembly elections. I mean, oh, I mentioned okay. in my paper oh. only Jansang ticket from Frostburg, which is my home oh, kind of constituency. Okay. And he put it on Kutar Singh Sandhu. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, everybody says they're Sandhu, so it's not a, it's not a kind and of. And Sandhu actually are very respectable. I mean, in one part of Punjab, they are very, very big landowners. And Rantalas? In the, the, some parts. In some parts, but they're very big landowners. They're equal, in this case. <laughs> but but sitting next to you, I was I was kind of reminded of a conversation I had, very different conversation mm -hmm. in Wolfson College. Uh, there was one student who, you know, was friendly with me. He said, "You see that old professor walking?" I said, "Yes." He said, "This old professor met me yesterday, and we were talking about various things, and I showed interest in Marxism." And this old professor told me that, "You see, my father has shaken hands with Frederick Engels. Frederick Engels was the colleague of." Uh, Marks. And he said, if you shake hands with me, you have only two hands here. So they <laughs> <laughs> sitting next to you. I thought, you know, you sat next to your father and you must have sat next to Bhagat Singh. So I'm he was in the Bodhi. No, no, he was in the Bodhi. Yeah, that's the colour server. You go the other way around. Can I just say one thing? If you go to the museum, which they've expanded, it, I mean, there's a statue of Bhagat Singh outside, standing there like this. But the museum has photograph after photograph of other young men who were hanged by the British. Ah. And, mm -hmm. and when you've done the, the sort of circuit of the museum, you come out in tears. Because he was just one of very sure. many mm -hmm. who were hanged. And when you read, see the photographs of all these young men who were hanged. Mm -hmm. And look, I've seen the big yeah. you know, the main And the if you've arts. been to somewhere like the Andamans, and you've been to Portland in the prison there, 
I think that's enough to make you cry because they were all political prisoners and they were hanged. And another thing I wanted to say was I, I don't think it's that surprising that um, uh, that Gishin Singh was an Arya Samaj's book. I mean, even the Nojuan Bharata, but it had a lot of um, um, not roots, but, but a lot of them were, say, taught in Arya Samaj schools, and there were links, and it wasn't that, uh, and there was a sort of, you know, Guru Gul system anyway, and, um, yeah, and, and you know, w whatever you know, has subsequently happened to the Arya Samaj, um, I don't think it's something that um, is surprising, because it was sort of quite um, active at the yeah. time in, in sort of stirring some feelings of yeah. um, some nation or nationalism that is true. as well. There's quite a lot about it, which I didn't read out, mm -hmm. which my father wrote, and uh, about the Arya I mean, he was actually, he found it amusing, he kissed and couldn't bear that. <laughs> so, but he was also very yeah. proud of his background and, and loved uh, exploring what what it constituted. And the uh, Ara Samaj, uh, you know, he says some pretty <laughs> awful things about it as well. But there's also that traditions of say, um, uh, you know, um, being drum jali um, or sort of or, or sort of saying celibate as well. And there's you know there's one story of. Um, one of the um, uh, Yashval, I don't know if people have heard of, but um, because he got married, I mean, there's a story that one of the um, uh, one of the people, one of his sort of cohorts in the Nojuan Bharatsabha was told to assassinate him, and because he got married, he dared to get married, and um, and then uh, luckily the person who'd been told to assassinate him was a British informer, because they. You know, the British had informers in, in all of these groups yes. as well. Um, and he didn't want to be done for murder, so he told Yushpal and, and then Yushpal, you know, so, so, there's, yeah. and, and so, the, so there's lots of different strands, you know, different types of boys, really. I mean, there were, there were you know, young men, boys, can students. I, can I just country. read you this paragraph about this very uh, topic that I'd left it out, but I, I will read it. Entry into the DAE primary, primary school did not prove to be the sea change from the period spent at the convent to an educational system, which was very different from my earlier experience. The main reason was the parental uh, pattern of life, even when I was at the convent. Ours being an R.S. Samaj's family, the emphasis from my infancy had been on certain Hindu values and a suspicion of other religious faiths. We were constantly told that but for Swami Dayanand, uh, that we would have all have been converted to Christianity or Islam. The nuns and the Christian prayer meetings at Sacred Heart had therefore failed to shake my trust in my father's judgment in favor of Hinduism and the Vedas, about which, of course, I knew nothing more than that they were sacred books, superior to the scriptures of other religions. We used to have a weekly congregation at school where the sermon by one of the teachers invariably <coughs> lauded the virtues of abstinence. So this is where your Brahmachari um, comes in. Um, a favorite exhortation used to run along the following lines. Dear boys, remember that you possess a treasure. Don't fritter it away. Lock it up and throw the key away. Dear boys, excellent. At that tender age of 10 or 11, one didn't understand what the treasure was. <laughs> it was only three or four years later at the high school that I learned that I was expected to avoid sex. Um, myths about the destruction wrought by sex experiences before the age of 25, the deadline prescribed by Swami Dayanand, were legion one would get tuberculosis and wither away from a couple of involuntary emissions during sleep. This horrendous superstition founded on a mysterious fear was to haunt me for a long time until my entry into college. It was the late Dr. K. L. Ridge, one of the most distinguished physicians of our days, and one time director of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi, who, was fi who finally put my mind at rest in the late 20s. Rubbish! Utter Arya Samaj's nonsense. <laughs> he assured me, but listen to this. All you need to do is eat an egg every time. There's <laughs> 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 some good treasure stuff. I think on that note, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a perfect note.
<laughs> the importance of eggs. <laughs> Who says PRG is not useful? <laughs> um, well, I must say thank you to Brunswick for a really um, entertaining and hugely illuminating talk. And then we should now have some tea and coffee because it's post lunch and you're all yawning. Yeah. <laughs>